Hello. Um, so I get the last slot of the day at the Linux Security Summit where I'm going to not be talking about Linux, so hopefully this is still relevant to us. Um, I, I'm going to start with a bit of an overview of what Zephyr is, because I think that's not necessarily well known. Um, it is a Linux Foundation project, but let's start with the, the official marketee's little blurb there. The Zephyr project is a scalable real-time operating system, RTOS, supporting multiple hardware architectures optimized for resource-constrained devices and built with safety and security in mind. Okay, what is Zephyr? Um, what, what is it? So some of those words make sense. It's a real-time operating system, if you're familiar with that. It's typically focusing on deadlines rather than multiple users, that kind of thing. But from the perspective, I'm coming at this from a security perspective. It's open source, so it's an Apache licensed, um, not quite the same license as the Linux kernel, but it, it's hosted in Git. Um, we actually host it on GitHub. We work with the pull request model. There are maintainers, mailing lists, and lots of meetings. Um, we use uh, kconfig, device trees. Um, we used to use kbuild, uh, that moved to, K to CMake. Um, just to give you an idea, a little comparison here between the Zephyr project source tree and the Linux tree as of about an hour and a half ago. Um, there's a few more lines of code in the Linux kernel. It, it's a bit bigger. Um, unfortunately, no, there isn't actually any Haskell code in in the Zephyr project. Um, there's a .hs file in there for some reason, which slot count counts, but uh, you get the idea. It's a C project, it's open source. We try to, a lot of people came from the Linux world and we've kind of brought a lot of the development mindset and methodology there. So to give you an idea though, it's a really busy project. Um, GitHub gives these nice statistics the 107 authors, 764 commits, 907 commits to all branches, thousands of files, tens of thousands or 50,000 additions, 18,000, that's just last month. As a comparison, and I'm not sure how well GitHub does this because it's not, doesn't use GitHub's model, but it still sees the same Git tree of the Linux kernel. You get actually pretty similar numbers out of that. Um, there's a lot more churn of the Zephyr code. There's a bunch of things where we're taking code and moving it into separate modules, and that's causing a lot of the, the changes and additions and deletions. But there's a lot happening with the code, is the idea. Uh, just to give you an idea, I don't expect those to be readable or identifiable, but there's about 170 little boards of various types um, there's another exciting picture that was felt too market ease to me to include that was shoes and hard hats and other interesting things that are running Zephyr. But what I want to go over is what's different between the Linux kernel and Zephyr. I mean, another way to put this, this is a Linux Foundation project. Why are we even doing this? We already have the Linux kernel. Um, key differences, Zephyr is typically a single address space. Um, there's a thing called a memory protection unit. It's like an MMU light. Um, it doesn't do address remapping. The only thing you get out of it is protection. You can say this block, and it's usually really restrictive. It might be a power of two alignment boundaries of that size of thing, and you get eight of them or 16 of them. Depends on the, the controller. It's typically no dynamic code. So that has radical impact on the threat model. The, we're not running code that an arbitrary user on a machine runs. We're running code that somebody building a product wanted in that product. At least we hopefully are running code. Um, turns out you really do need to count for arbitrary code running because there are bugs. Um, buffer overflows incoming data, that kind of thing. It's still can be possible to run code, but it's still a different environment of how it's how it comes about and how it's run. 
Another really big difference is we tend to do a lot of things at compile time that would normally be dynamic on a Linux system. Um, how many threads do you have? Uh, what kind of devices do you have in your system? How much memory are you configured for? A lot of that would be a compile time choice. Uh, the idea is to get the code small. I mean, think about what we're targeting here are microcontrollers where you think of hundreds of kilobytes of code and maybe tens or hundreds of kilobytes of RAM, and that's it. So it's not a dynamic system. It's, well, I could show my age. It's the kind of computer that I started programming on, except really, really tiny and cost 50 cents. So with all that aside of what Zephyr is, let's talk about security. And just a little bit of background. I, um, I work at Lenaro. I've been there just under four years, um, hired onto the security working group team. And for about three years, I've been having this focus on IoT. I came from actual Linux kernel security before that. And just this past, I guess it was about six months ago, I was elected as the security architect for the Zephyr project. It was an exciting election to the end. Of, I ran and no one else did. So it was, as long as someone voted, I would have won. But I want to go over what are we doing about security in this project? Um, Linux gets a lot of focus. Greg gives his talks about CVEs. What are we doing in this project for security? And so I'm going to break time down into real, real easy divisions of past, present, future, what we've done, what we're doing, and what are our kind of grandiose plans. So now we get slides with lots of words on them. Um, so big thing is memory protection. And this is fairly new. Most RTOSs kind of don't do this. They assume you have a simple address space and everything just runs. And we started out, well, we have this memory unit, this memory protection unit. What can we do? The obvious thing is to look at what Linux does. You have user space and you have kernel space. These processors typically have kind of the same division of a protected privileged mode and a non-privileged mode. Um, if you look, each processor uses different words for them just to help keep everything confusing. So we added this memory protection. Um, turns out it's not, I mean, it's, quite, it's actually quite useful. There's a lot of things it protects for. But as I mentioned before, with that user model of what code is running on the system, it's not necessarily protecting against the right things. Uh, turns out it's pretty easy to have a lot of things on the wrong side of that boundary. Um, you can get a system where a small amount of application code is running in user mode, and then most of your system and most of the code that's vulnerable is still running in privileged mode. So despite the fact we have this done, there's a lot of work to do for memory protection. Um, a lot of that is taking, in order to move something to the outside of this boundary, you need to come up with system calls. And it's not POSIX really here, it's system calls specific for drivers, pieces of drivers. And we have to figure out what those are. So we've done that, it's kind of a past thing, but there's a lot more to do. So I wanted to give that to make sure that it sounds like we've done practical things because a lot of these points, they sound like things you would give at a talk at a conference instead of things you'd actually do to improve security. And that's because they are, but they're also, they are important things, but they don't immediately directly translate into code. So the rest of these things we've done, we have a security subcommittee. Um, this meets bi-weekly, and that little star means there's more slides coming. Uh, we've created documentation on secure coding practices. Um, if you've ever tried to do that, it turns out it's really hard to do. Um, what it really boils down to is, and it's actually worded pretty much this way, is you need to have people on your team that know about security and know what to look for in code. So we've created this documentation. It's public. It's on the, the zephyrproject.org website. There's a little security button. I'm going to talk a little bit in a minute about 
what we've done with our Git repositories to try to focus a little bit on security as well as safety. Then some of the more possibly controversial things, uh, we've registered with MITRE as a CVE numbering authority. And as you can imagine, these are some interesting meetings we get to go to to discuss what are a bunch of rules that essentially amount to how you allocate integers to uh, when does a particular vulnerability become one CVE or does it become multiple CVEs? How do they correspond with patches? Um, just try to get some homogeneity and to try to make the database useful. Um, we've, it's been about a year now that we've got this. We've, I think we've done about four official CVEs. That doesn't mean we haven't fixed bugs. We've, we do fix bugs. Um, things that have been reported against previously JIRA, now GitHub. There's, when I last checked, 6,514 issues that have been closed as fixed. Um, no real easy notion of whether those are all security fixes. Sometimes that's hard to know. Uh, we joked at our last security meeting, somebody said, well, we just need something to tell us what's a security bug. And so I said, Alexa, is this a security bug? and was immediately greeted by someone's Alexa in the meeting uh, defining bug. So it didn't even help when, I, uh, when it did hear me. Uh, a couple other things. There's this uh, thing called the Core Infrastructure Initiative, CII, that has this notion of best practices. And they're not specific things to software, but they're things like when you have a website, you have to use HTTPS and these things. And there's a big list of those, and they have different levels that you can qualify for. We are now passing as gold. It's a pretty smaller subset of the projects that are using this infrastructure initiative. So that's kind of a nice thing. At least it tells us that our source code isn't going to change easily without us being aware of it, that kind of thing. And then just lastly, some of the things we've done is using uh, automation to prevent regressions. Um, the CI um, that was set up pretty early in the project. We have a lot of targets, there's about 170 of them. We build them and we make sure that all of the sample applications, all the tests, not everything can be run. We don't have all of this hardware, but at least we can build it and make sure it keeps building. All right, so what is this subcommittee? Um, it's defined by the charter when Zephyr was created. The Zephyr project was created at the Linux Foundation. Um, Zephyr is a project you jo that companies join. Uh, the, the funds are used to run the company, and there's different levels of contribution that people can or companies can contribute to. And the way it's defined is each platinum member gets a seat, and then we can invite other people by invitation from that. And then there's two roles. There's a security chair, which is elected by the rest of the subcommittee. And they're basically responsible for running the meetings, for taking notes, for making sure stuff happens. And then there's the security architect, that's me, that's basically defined to be responsible for overall project security. The, the idea is significant changes that are at least theoretically supposed to affect security are supposed to go through the security architect before they're made to the project. So what do we do about our repositories? I'm sure most people are familiar with the long-term stable release of the Linux kernel and we do something quite similar to this. Uh, we've, we've had two of, or no, I think we've only had one of these. Um, I'd have to think back on that one. We have zero, one or two of these uh, long-term stable releases. It's a fairly recent thing for us to have them. They've been in planning for quite some time. And we have this other branch that we call auditable, which is kind of like the long-term stable, but more so. So the idea of LTS is a little different than it might be in a lot of other projects. I mean, it's product focused, uh, it's current code with the latest security updates. Interestingly, we want to bring in compatibility with new hardware. Um, Zephyr, people add boards very frequently to Zephyr, and usually they want to use them. 
fairly quickly. And so we don't really have a pro prohibition against using brand new code from a new board in this long-term stable release. So those are generally, those patches are generally pulled back into the, the new hard, the long-term stable release. They tend to be isolated changes to just a group of files. And the main thing, this, this code is more tested. Um, the cycle of development is extended and it's supposed to be stable for the long term. It's what you would choose to bring into a product. If you're going to build an IoT device, a sensor, a, a shoe, any of these interesting things that people come up with for devices, this is a good starting point for that, this is the idea. Um, it's it's feature-based, focusing on hardening the functionality of what's there. It, it's not intended to be cutting edge to bring in the new latest stuff. Now, that's the one in the middle. This one on the, the right, this auditable, is a branch off of the long-term stable release. And significantly, it is a subset of the code. And the idea here is there's a lot of types of certification. Uh, many of them involve safety, but there are a handful of these that involve se uh, security issues. Uh, FIPS 140-3-2 um, is, is a big one that people want to build products and then get these certifications. The idea is to have a part of the code that's a starting point for that, that we can address the issues, even to work with the labs to get, maybe call it pre-certification or certifiable is a term that we've, we've used. And the idea is if you're building a product, excuse me, <coughs> if you're building a product that needs some kind of certification or multiple, multiple kinds of certification, this is a good starting point for you. Um, and this is just starting. We, we haven't done any of these certifications yet. This is just a beginning of something we're kind of seeing that we need to do. So that's where we're at now. As far as where we're going, um, first point there is we're trying to be open about this. Uh, have the product documentation publish what it is, what our goals are. And then just these list of things that are in that documentation. Um, we're working on coding guidelines. Um, that's a link when these slides are sent out, you can click on it. That will take you to our current coding standards, uh, current guidelines. Um, how to report vulnerabilities. It's a, a big one with C the CVE process is that people know I found a vulnerability, it may be sensitive, who do I send it to? Can I get a PGP key to encrypt it to so that it isn't just flying out over the internet freely? What happens when I send that vulnerability report in? Um, so that's documented. And then we have currently a JIRA instance to manage bugs during any kind of embargo process that's needed. Um, this is still fluid, we're using JIRA because of it has a richer permission model than GitHub did at the time. Uh, GitHub's adding support for security advisories. We may evaluate o over time just moving to GitHub so that we don't have two different places that bugs are stored. Because right now we have all of our issues in GitHub except for these security issues which get reported to JIRA. So that database is mostly not visible. Uh, once something has become published, uh, so once release notes refer to it, the link will work. Uh, we change the permissions on it and you can go look at that particular issue to find out information about it. All right. So I talked about the coding guideline. Um, Linux kernel has a, a document that I believe Linus originally wrote, which how do you write code for the kernel? Um, we started with this. Uh, one of the first things we did with the Zephyr project is go through and make it look like Linux code. Um, some of that was using tabs to indent and proper spacing on different things. But when, especially when you get to safety certification, but security certifications look at these a little bit, 
Um, there's some documents about uh, MISRA C 2012, uh, which has an amendment, a um, couple of these other documents to use as a reference. And the thing about these, these documents is they're kind of a mixture of some really good ideas and what were they thinking. There's, um, so what we're trying to do is incorporate these in, but we realize you can't just say, oh, well, all your code must comply with this document that, that's not publicly available. You, you must comply, good luck. So we are looking into tooling that can selectively enforce these different kind of requirements. And, you know, these vary from basic things like you can't have global variables that aren't used to things. It's about being able to, when you do security sensitive code, to audit that code, all of it. And then typically involves looking at the assembly output of the compiler and making sure the compiler did the right thing. And so there's a lot of stuff in there about writing code that fits with that. But there's also things in there like no dynamic memory allocation at all. So if you're building something with Zephyr that uses TCP, or uses, not TCP, well that has allocation too, um, uses TLS, uh, there's allocation in all of, as far as I know, the TLS libraries, embed TLS that we use. So we, that's why we have that auditable code base, that you can have a smaller subset of the code that's able to comply with these things. So a security guy, a coding guideline doesn't magically make all of your code better, but it's, it's a starting point. It, it, it gives some things that we can look to that you shouldn't do this in your code and a tool that will flag when you do that so that we can at least analyze whether, well, should you be able to do that and do we need to write up an exception and that kind of thing. So another example in our code, so this is kind of what we're doing now. This is a, an open PR for updating our entropy random framework. We got a couple reports of vulnerabilities about a subsystem or another subsystem that we're using what turns out a not to be a cryptographic random number generator for part of a protocol that needed cryptographic random numbers to be secure. So, and there's a couple of those. So what we're doing is uh, we're actually going through the, the randomness, the entropy code, separating them out, separating the randomness API so that it's very clear what you're asking for. If you just have a function that's, you know, give me random data, doesn't really tell you, is that cryptographically secure random data? Is that just kind of random that might be good for a, a, a back-off timer? What's it good for? So this is the kind of thing we discuss in the, the security subcommittee. Um, in this case, I was actually somebody on the team that worked on the issue. And, and the goal here is to clean up our API. We're in kind of a neat position of being able to change our APIs and document things so that it's easier for people to do the right thing. That these things are documented and even just named better so that you know what you need to call if you need to do something. And that includes things like the entropy API is made clear that you probably don't want to call this. You, you probably don't need entropy unless you're implementing your own deterministic random bit generator and make sure that it's clear. No, you don't want to call entropy, you want to call the output of a random bit generator that itself will use entropy to seed itself. So we're, what, what's, what's our goal? I mean, we want to make Zephyr more secure. And what does that mean? And so we've, as a, the security subcommittee, we've kind of had to sit down and decide what are some things that we want to do? And then we have to work with the technical steering committee to decide which of these things we're going to do. So just a couple of slides here on what are our goals for the upcoming year. So right now, we have this kind of mishmash of crypto drivers. We include both embed TLS. It's pulled in through our brand new module system as, well, 
it's not a git submodule, it's not a repo thing, it's a west thing. Um, we have our own tool that was written for that to pull in dependencies. And then we also have TinyCrypt, which is, as you can imagine, a small cryptographic library. And different parts of the code call different ones of these. And so the, there's an ongoing discussion of, do we need a more unified API so that these can be plugged in and you can use different implementations for this? Um, so there's a thing by ARM called the Platform Security Architecture. It's large and has many parts, but one of those is they have a crypto API, which is basically started with the crypto library underneath embed TLS with some name changes. And they've actually changed embed TLS to use this API as defined. So that's kind of one obvious choice. It's targeted for embedded devices, the same as we are targeting. Um, there's other people pushing for something like PKCS 11. Um, this is used, for example, by Amazon FreeRTOS as their official crypto API. And these are ongoing discussions. We want to evaluate these. What do we do? Another thing we want to be looking into is FIPS 140-3. Um, when I first wrote these slides, it wasn't accessible, the, the text of the, the standard. Um, it is now. I haven't actually taken the time to read it. But people build these. It's um, intended for cryptographic modules. So first thing to think of is the, the little module that sits inside of an ATM that performs the cryptographic operations isolated from the rest of the system. There's a move to use this for things that are parts of systems and separated devices. But a lot of people demand the certificate, or at least compliance with this. Uh, a lot of specs, the Bluetooth spec talks about, well, you need this such and such cryptography that needs to be FIPS 140-2 compliant. And the focus really here is on the crypto operations. They want to make sure you, you do the right thing, that you have the right primitives available, uh, that you've implemented them correctly, that they, they continue to do the right thing. They have a set of test suites that you have to run on boot in order to be compliant. And the, the idea is this is a, a common way for people to get kind of an assurance that something providing cryptographic operations maybe does them right. So we're looking into, for people who want to use Zephyr to build something that is going to comply with FIPS 140-2 or 3, how do we help them? Uh, the, generally, they certify products. Um, we're an OS, not a product, but there's still things that we can do so that if somebody pulls this code in, the certification lab maybe knows, oh, that came from the Zephyr auditable tree, which has been pre-certified, and it just takes less work and less money for them. So another big issue um, is with secure boot. Uh, we've been working on this for a couple of years now with Zephyr. Um, there's a, a bootloader called MCU boot, and caveat, I'm one of the maintainers of that project that started out as the bootloader for one, one OS, Minute. We've uh, generalized this, uh, that it now supports at least Zephyr and Minute. Uh, there's some other things being worked on for that. And what it is, it's a, a small bootloader, so it has a lot less functionality than something like U-Boot or what might be found in a UEFI BIOS. It does upgrades. It can revert these upgrades, check signatures against public keys that are kept in ROM in the device. Um, and, and as an example, the trusted firmware project for M-class architectures, the microcontrollers, is using MCU boot as its bootloader. And for Zephyr, we can build with this bootloader. We can use it. Uh, things that need to be done is it's not a clean setup right now to build an application that uses the bootloader. You kind of have to go build that yourself and assemble the things and try to make the image out of it. We also don't have a real good upgrade story. How do you do upgrades over the air? Where do they, um, where do they come from? And this is in process. We have a couple of pull requests open. Um, 
and one I believe just closed, just merged, to implement various standards that have been developed for distributing firmware over the air, having it with the signatures. Um, there's a thing called SUIT, which is the IETF Working Group for Software Update for IoT, and this is a attempt to build a, a manifest format. It's an RFC describing a manifest format to describe what's in a firmware image. So to have a standard format rather than the ad hoc one we made for MCU boot. And then things like richer key infrastructure. Um, right now, it's one public key that somebody had to use to sign every firmware image on every device. And clearly there's a need for whether that be X509 signature certificates with chaining or something else, but there's any for something richer than that. And then there's an interest in fuzzing. Fuzzing gets a lot of news. You talk about vulnerabilities that are found by fuzzing the Linux kernel, different parts of it, fuzzing different programs. Um, in case you're not familiar with it, the idea of fuzzing is it's a tool that basically generates garbage as inputs to something to try to exercise all of the edge cases looking for vulnerabilities. Um, most fuzzing work is done on larger systems than Zephyr typically targets. Um, the typical fuzzing is a library you link in with your application while you build it with additional profiling information so that the fuzzing tool can determine what paths the code is taking to direct the fuzzing data that's passed in. Because um, otherwise you have a problem of just too much data, it's too hard to find the edge cases. Um, there is a research project, I forget what university it is, on a QEMU based fuzzer where the rich part of the fuzzing is done on a, say, a Linux machine and then the application is running in emulation and it watches that and feeds it the, the data. Because um, the thing is that existing fuzzers often assume lots of memory. Um, the, the, we do have a POSIX native port of Zephyr, but not everything works there. Uh, you don't have network devices. You typically will have sockets available at, as user space tasks. and. There's a lot of things that are, a lot of the code that doesn't get exercised in this environment. Um, big thing is, this is an open area for research. Um, if anyone finds this fascinating, it's a, it, it would be a very useful place to put effort. I'll just leave it at that. And lastly, um, documentation. We want to improve our documentation. Um, we, well, I, I wrote some threat models for Zephyr a couple years back. I've since learned what a threat model actually is, and it'd be nice to go back and take some time to write down what I wrote down as a threat model to read like a threat model, and also to figure out, is it pertinent anymore, and to maybe find some more applicable environments or configurations, other applications, other contexts where that threat model would apply. So that's all I have for the, the Zephyr security update. Um, I guess I got a couple of minutes if anyone has any questions. Hey, uh, so I have uh, two questions if the time allows. Uh, the first is, have you considered um, more safe language uh, instead of C? I'd love to. Um, which one are you thinking of? Well, uh, <laughs> I've, uh, I've just lo looked it up and it turns out that it's possible to run Go or Rust or whatever on uh, things like my, uh, Microbit. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful idea. I don't think that's gonna happen on the Zephyr project for quite some time. Uh, the, the projects doing the safe languages in embedded targets are pretty immature right now, but it's definitely a great direction to go. I don't know how long it's gonna be before we wanna move there. I mean, there's kind of a joke on the, the Reddit channel for Rust that people say, oh, we'll rewrite it in Rust. 
And that's not usually a good answer for something. Um, but there's definitely a place for new applications to at least start by looking at that and see if we can get these tools to a state where that's useful. So. I see, yeah, thanks. So, uh, and uh, since you're stuck with C, um, <laughs> what is your testing strategy and do you have any tools like ASAN? So, one of the difficulties is that there are such constrained devices that this code runs in. We do, so we have some static analysis that we're running right now, which can detect some cases of buffer overflows, memory usage issues, that kind of thing. A lot of it is we test a lot. We, we build all of the code, we run it, um, we hope we find the things, but no, there's a lot of need for that, for something like that. Um, the challenges of how do you do that in a device that has 100 kilobytes of RAM? You know, what do you do with you know, we've added memory protection. As a, that's a, a significant thing. Can we partition things more fine-grained so that things that shouldn't be handing data, accessing data, don't, and that kind of thing. But if people have, if you have ideas, that would be really helpful too. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your talk. Um, could you elaborate how much code do, uh, do different platforms share? I mean, I know Zephyr can run on x86 and all those small microcontrollers as well. How mm -hmm. much code do these platforms share in common? So without opening a terminal window, I can't give you exact numbers. Um, there's a lot of common code. So the code that's dependent on the devices. You, you will have architecture-specific code for ARM, for Cortex-M33, for Cortex, a specific processor. It's not that much code. The whole system is, is much smaller than something like Linux. But most of the code that's not common is, is drivers. Um, the core code for scheduling, that kind of thing, is shared. Be between everything, um, but again, I can't really give you. If we want to, like, pull up the code afterwards, I could get more detailed numbers. If we just want to look through the tree, there it's pretty cleanly divided. I just asked because uh, I wanted to understand if I, for example, fuzz Zephyr on one platform. Mm -hmm. uh, how about bugs which I found? Uh, do they applicable to other platforms? Right. And so that's going to depend on where the bug is found, obviously. But a lot of the, the core stuff for whether it be, I mean, the networking stack is not going to be specific to a, to a platform. The Bluetooth stack is not going to be specific to a platform. So there's a lot of that code. So as long as what you, if what you find is a bug in your platform, the, say the flash driver that you are, the driver for the Bluetooth hardware, um, that's probably only going to apply to that. But if you find a, a bug in how memory protection and semaphores work, that's probably general. And one small question. As a security architect, what do you th think about bug bounty for Zephyr? <laughs> it's kind of beyond my scope to come up with where the funds would for that would come from. It, we do get reports from researchers the bounty might increase that. I don't know. It, it's, you know what, I'll bring it up. I'll bring it up with the TSC. It's, I mean, the people who make the decisions about money can certainly set aside some for something like that. Thank you. Any other questions? Note, let's thank the speaker. Thanks.